Psalm 23, if you get both of those, then that was a blessing. There's nothing boring about the ministry. We had a funeral this past year, a young man. Uh, well, we've had a rough year. We had a, y'all know about Brother Cleghorn, 19 year old boy, drowned in a lake. Not too long before that, we had two brothers in our church that died uh, exactly two months apart. One of them was 19, one of them was 22. One of them was killed in a, well, we won't go into all the details, but, but one of them clearly had, uh, had been around a lot of different people and a lot of, a lot of different crowd. And <clears throat> after the funeral, a young man asked me if he could talk to me. And uh, I said, sure. We went down to my study and he was a sodomite. Been living a life of sodomy for years. And uh, was telling me all that he had been through and just was, was miserable inside. Just literally hate, hated living, hated himself. And that day he got born again. Amen. Now that was a first for me. And I was thrilled to tell him what Jesus Christ could do for anybody. And you should have seen the glow on his face. And uh, listen, if you get serious about trying to do something, something for God, he'll, it's amazing what he'll let you have a part of. And it's really, it's just unbelievable that He lets us have a part in it. I always feel extremely inadequate to preach a missions conference when we are surrounded by missionaries like the ones that are here tonight. I appreciate these missionaries. I know several of them. And um, uh, I, I know none of them feel like heroes. And we really don't have heroes. Jesus Christ is our hero. But we tell our church, if there's any heroes left, it's missionary or military. And uh, that's the people we want to esteem, and that's the people that we want our kids to grow up and want to be like if they're going to be like somebody. And I want you missionaries to know I greatly appreciate you. And pray God might give you something tonight, tomorrow night, Wednesday night. We'll start in John 10. I preached a message here three years ago in a family conference that is the kissing cousin to this message that I'm going to preach tonight. And uh, it is probably the most hated message I preach. It may not sound like a missions message, but it's the reason people won't do missions. But I'm, I'm, I struggled with preaching it here. I, you know, as pastors, we have like, I have over 4,000 sermons, and sometimes it's the Lord puts His finger on one, and I'm going, why? But we've got to be obedient. And uh, America's in trouble. We are in serious trouble. Still to this day, 46 churches close their doors in America every week. Now, tonight in America, half the children living in America have never been to church. Anywhere. We are the, our country is the fourth largest unchurched population in the world. We are becoming a pagan nation. And we better wake up. And I don't think I even need to say that to this church. I think you're awake. I tell you, I, when I walk into this church, my heart is warmed immediately because there's some people here that love God, love the book, love missionaries, love preaching, love your pastor, love your church family. That's a blessing, but that's not the norm anymore. And so I'm thankful to be here. I appreciate uh, Brother Tim letting me come back. Take your Bible, please. Turn to John 10, Psalm 23. And if you're able, could you stand, please, as we honor the reading of the Word of God? We'll start with John 10 and then go to Psalm 23, probably the most familiar and famous psalm of all. And uh, I'm going to preach a message I call Restoring the Soul. Now let me just go ahead and ask you, are there some things in your life that need to be restored? A lot of people sitting in a Baptist church and say, you know, I used to take a lot of notes in church. I used to get up every morning at 4.30 and pray for 30 minutes. I used to read my Bible X number of pages a day. I used to weep over sinners going to hell. I used to grieve over my lost family. I used to. Is it possible you need some things restored tonight? The Bible says in John 10 verse 10, <clears throat> this is the Lord Jesus of course talking, and He says the thief, who's the thief? That's the devil. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to what? Destroy. Remember that word. But Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm 23. 
Verse 1, would you say that there were some times in the life of David he needed to get some things restored? You know what he says here? He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I walked into a Sunday school class in a church I was pastoring years and years and years ago before I left the convention, and it was the children's Sunday school class, and on the tables were all of their little literature books, and on the front cover was Psalm 23.1, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I want. That's not what it says. <laughs> Needless to say, we had a business meeting the following week. Not long after that, I left and started Cornerstone Baptist Church. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. I'm going to stop right there. Let's pray. Father... I sure am thankful to be right here right now at this moment what I consider one of the biggest events of the year in any church. And I believe it is for you, Lord. I believe that you desire to do a work here this week. And I pray, God, that in spite of me and, Lord, um, in spite of, of our failures and weaknesses that you'll show up. Lord, I appreciate that song we heard a little while ago that, that you love us. And it's almost, it is in spite of us. I'm glad your love is unconditional in Christ. I pray, God, tonight that you'll take this weak, frail creature of dust. I pray you'll take this base, despised thing of naught and allow the Holy Ghost to do through me what I cannot do. And I pray, oh God, that you'd speak to your people and help them tonight. Bless this church. And God, use this time for your glory is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. Be seated. Let me see if you can finish this statement. Slow as molasses. Very good. Amen. That's one of them southern English terms I think we heard about. Well, you know what molasses is. Uh, and, and people say it's, it's slow. Let me just ask you a question. If I, I believe this mic's working. If I had a, suppose I had a five-gallon bucket of molasses, and Brother Crotch was standing right there, and I took that five-gallon bucket of molasses and I poured it out real quick, and it started rushing towards him. Would it knock him down? No. No. How about if I had 10 gallon? How about, how about a 50-gallon drum up here full of molasses, and he's about halfway down that aisle, and I throw it at him as fast as I can. Boom! Is it going to knock him down? No. No, but there's something that happened. It's a true story. You can, you can check me out on this. I promise you it is a true story. And it happened in 1919 in Boston, Massachusetts. Please listen to this. The Purity Distilling Company had constructed a massive storage tank out of steel and concrete. It was riveted together with a concrete base. This tank was 50 feet tall. It was 90 feet in diameter. And it was built to hold molasses brought in from all over the world and used primarily to make rum. That's what it was there for. On January the 15th, 1919, the tank was just about full, holding approximately two and one-half million gallons of molasses. At approximately 12.30 on January the 15th, there was a loud explosion. The steel plates of the tank were ripped apart, and over two million gallons of molasses, an estimated 14,000 tons, moving at an estimated 35 miles per hour, flooded downtown Boston. It happened. The flood of molasses crumpled the steel support of an elevated train. It knocked over a fire station, collapsed various buildings, killed a number of horses, and worst of all, 21 people were killed by a flood of molasses. Check me out. It's a true story. One article the next day described the deaths of some of those victims as being frozen in time. 21 people drowning and molasses. So what's that got to do with John 10? Well, let me say this. I read you that story to tell you that enough of anything can be deadly. Enough of anything can be deadly. Number two, things are not always as they appear. And even something very slow and very innocent in appearance can be very destructive. So I'm asking you, has some th have some things been destroyed in your life? Are you living the abundant life? That's why Jesus came. Or are there some things that need to be restored? I promise you this can make a difference in a missions conference. Jesus said the thief, the devil, came to steal, to kill, 
and to destroy. How does he do it? How does the devil do this? Well, he shows up with a bottle of poison, clearly marked poisonous, and says, please drink some of this. No, he shows up with a jar of free molasses. Something appealing. Something free even. Listen, Satan has mowed down the likes of Moses and Job and Elijah and Abraham and Noah and Samson and the list of endless is endless of people that he has destroyed their lives at some point in their life and he's after you. And he's after Bible-believing Christians in America. As a matter of fact, let me show you this in Luke chapter 22. Would you back up there to Luke 22 if you're still in John? Go to Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Now I'll say some things tonight that might sound a little bit extreme. But, um, you know, I, I tell you, Americans have gotten used to a lot of things we should have never gotten used to. And it's doing more damage than we care to admit. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 22, I said that the devil's out to destroy you. He destroyed many of the people in the Bible, at least their testimony. And here in Luke 22 verse 31, the Lord said something to Simon Peter in verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. Isn't that an awesome statement? That the Son of God, who you say, well, I wish you'd pray for me. He prays for you every day. He's at the right hand of the Father ever interceding on behalf of the saints. He says, Peter, the devil's out to get you, but I'm praying for you. Watch this. That thy faith fail not. You know how the devil wants to destroy you? He wants to destroy your faith. I appreciate the missionary who has enough confidence that if I can just get the Word of God in their hands, who knows what might happen? Because faith cometh by... Hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But the devil wants to destroy faith. I believe I heard your pastor say that you are doing faith promise. What is that? That's giving by faith. Right? So if the devil can destroy your faith, he can destroy your giving. He can destroy a lot of things if he can destroy your faith. And we know, we've read it, we've quoted it, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, but you and I now live in a visual society. Everything is visual. Paul said we walk by faith, not by sight. Not many of us can say that. I don't even know if we understand faith. I got saved by faith. What's that? I took God at His Word. I believed what God said even though I couldn't see God. Even though I couldn't see Calvary. I couldn't see the cross. But I took God and His Word and by faith I trusted Him and got born again. And now Paul says that you've been saved by faith. I want you to live by faith. I want you to walk by faith. But we are constantly being bombarded with what's in front of our eyes. Have you ever said this to somebody? Can't you see what I'm saying? Faith cometh by hearing. Don't get mad at me, missionary. But if I were a missionary in a third world country, I would not show a video of Jesus Christ on a cross. I wouldn't do it. I've talked to missionaries who've gone to those places and shown the burning hell and shown the passion of Christ and and thousands upon thousands get saved. Do they really? I remember when the movie uh, Mel Gibson came out, The Passion of Christ. A bunch of my church members, Brother Ron, you got to watch it. Brother Ron, you got to watch it. I said, I don't want to watch it because I'll get some Catholic version of what happened at Calvary and it won't be the Bible version. And every time I walk into some church, I'll see somebody and call him Jesus and it won't be Jesus. The Jesus of the pictures on Baptist churches and the Jesus of Hollywood is not the Jesus of the Bible. You wouldn't even recognize him if he walked in here tonight. Because you have too many visual images in your mind. And they destroy reality. And and people have... Don't misunderstand me. If somebody watched that movie and got saved, praise the Lord, but that doesn't justify the movie. The end does not justify the means. You might go into a bar tomorrow night and start drinking a beer and lead someone to Christ. That's not going to justify you going into a bar and drinking. Amen. 
But we're living in a visual society. I heard somebody say not too long ago, more pe- people have seen more faces on a screen than they have in reality now. And people are communicating now without even looking face to face or eyeball to eyeball. That's the reason they don't know how to communicate when they're confronted with a real human being. I'm telling you, it's a problem that is destroying the faith of God's people. And if we're going to live by faith and walk by faith, and if somebody's going to grow up at at Bear Trail Baptist Church and one day be called to the mission field, he's going to need some faith. So the devil wants to destroy the faith of these children before they ever get 16. He wants them to live by sight where everything that moves them and motivates them and shapes them and drives them is what they can see with their eyes. So the devil is out to destroy the faith. And he doesn't show up with a horn or a tail and a hat that says Satan. I've said it many times. I've said in the Old Testament, if you look at the Bible, it looks like that in the Old Testament, the devil went after man's soul and and God uh, offered some sacrifices. God himself killed an innocent lamb offered a sacrifice for Adam. And so God provided the sacrifices. The devil saw that that wasn't going to work. So then when you come to the New Testament, he goes after man's body. And thus you read about the catacombs and the martyrdom and you read about the slaughter of innocent Christians all over the world in the first and second century. And then Christianity thrived in hard times. That may be coming our way. And so the devil saw that that didn't work. First he went after man's soul. Then he went after man's body. I believe now in these last days he's going after the mind of men. The mind of men. Now the word soul in your Bible does not always mean the same thing. That's the lovely thing about the King James Bible. You can't nail down a word and make it mean the same thing every time. It's a beautiful thing. But in the Bible, the word soul sometimes is talking about the eternal part of man. We sing a song where the soul of man never dies. Your soul is going to live somewhere forever. That's your eternal being. It's inside of you. Sometimes in the Bible, the word soul means the whole being, spirit, soul, and body, but the Bible used the word soul to talk about the entire being. But let me tell you that most of the time when the Bible uses the word soul, it's talking about man's emotional being. Let me just read you a bunch of verses. You don't need to try to look these up. I'm just going to read you a bunch of verses real quick about the soul. Now remember, I'm trying to show you that the soul is primarily man's emotional being. The Bible says in Genesis 42, 21, that it was in the anguish of his soul. In Numbers 21, the soul of the people was much discouraged. In Numbers 21, they, the soul loathed the light bread. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 24, you seek him with all of your heart and all of your soul. The Bible says in Judges 10 that his soul was grieved. In 1 Samuel 1, Hannah's was in bitterness of soul. In 1 Samuel 30, uh, the soul of all the people was grieved. In 2 Samuel 13, David's soul longed. In Job 3, it was bitter in soul. In Psalm 35, my soul shall be joyful. Psalm 42, my soul panteth after thee. Psalm 42 again, my soul thirsteth after thee. Jesus in in Matthew 26, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. In Luke 1, my soul magnifies the Lord. Jesus in John 12, now is my soul troubled. And then the Bible says fear came upon every soul in Acts chapter 2. So you got fear and trouble and sorrow and panting and longing and grieving and bitterness and it's all a part of the soul. The soul is man's emotional being. And then there's a verse. You might want to look this one up. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. This is one of my go-to verses in the Bible to try to get people to live a little different kind of lifestyle. Would you look at this in 1 Peter chapter 2? I don't always stop and pause here, but I want you to see this. I think it's one of the most overlooked Verses in the Bible. Peter said, Dearly beloved, I'm in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. What's the next word? Abstain. Now that's what we tell kids to do, isn't it? Maybe we need to practice some of this. What does it say? Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What's wrong with man's soul? What's wrong with man's emotional well-being? A bunch of fleshly lust got him torn all to pieces. He's pursuing all these fleshly lusts and so he's emotionally distraught and discouraged and, and up and down and hot and cold and in and out. He's, he's just a mess. 
The Bible says abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Paul said that war is going on in my mind in Romans chapter 7. There's a war against the law of my mind. He talked about how it brings him into captivity. The Bible says no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. There's a war going on. The devil is out to destroy you. Remember, he's out to destroy. So how does he do it? He goes after your emotional well-being. So what are we seeing today, even in Bible-believing churches, with all of the mental sicknesses and addictions and phobias and chronic worriers and tension and depression and stress and chaos and confusion and uncontrolled anger and bitterness and depression and zombies in Baptist churches who are cold and numb and past feeling? Why? These eyes. When I was growing up, first of all, for us to watch a television show, somebody had to go outside and turn the antenna and stand there and hold it until something came in. And when you saw a starving kid in Indonesia with flies all over it, you just, you just hurt and you wept. And it broke you. And now Americans sit in front of a screen bigger than the wall and watch rapes and murders and bloodshed. And nothing moves us. People talk about the dumbing down of America. I talk about the numbing down of America. The Bible says if we're not careful, we'll be like the, in Ephesians 4, the Gentiles who walk after the vanity of their mind and our past feeling. It is the pursuit of physical, tangible, carnal, material things that is ruining us emotionally and destroying the soul so that we don't have a burden and we don't have a prayer life and, and we don't grieve over our own sin, much less the sins of others. I'm telling you, Satan's slow, sure attack on the mind is being seen in America. And it's also obvious. And he didn't show up with a bottle of poison. He showed up with a jar of molasses. Something very innocent in appearance. Something that didn't seem to be that big of a deal. Satan, when I say Satan destroys people's lives, see if I say the devil destroyed that life, you tend to think of drugs, alcohol, Pornography, illicit sex. You think of all kinds of terrible things. Say, yeah, boy. You, you see these kids that, that at 16, 17, 18, if literally, literally, listen, 30 minutes from where I live, the sheriff of the county put out a video of kids coming into his jail hooked on meth. Puts them behind the bars. A few hours later, puts another boy that's on meth behind the bars beside him. And if this boy's got some money, he'll buy that boy's urine and drink it. To get that meth in his system. And we see that and say, the devil has destroyed their lives. But God might look down tonight at some independent King James fundamental Bible-believing Baptist church that could hear Brother Molinax get up here and tell about these people getting saved in Korea or China and how they're doing it and hear him sing a song about, oh, how I love Jesus, and you'd be completely unfazed, completely unmoved. And God looks down and says, the devil's destroyed that life. See, I'm not talking about destroyed physically. I'm not talking about being destroyed like some of these kids that are strung out on drugs or, or behind bars for whatever. I'm talking about destroyed in terms of your effectiveness as a child of God. You have no prayer life. You have no power in prayer. You don't weep over souls. You don't weep over your family's soul. You don't cry about the things that you... You know what I tell people what bothers me? What really bothers me is what bothers me. <laughs> and what bothers me worse than that is what doesn't bother me. Did y'all catch what I just said? Isn't it amazing what, what, what grieves us and what excites us? My soul, I mean grown men, grown men watching a football game. And they're down at the half yard line. Fourth and goal. And there's 11 guys on this side, 11 on that side. 
And here's a guy back here that's six foot five and weighs 320 pounds. And right in front of the football is some white chalk. That's all it is. And they turn around and hand that big old gorilla a ball. He moves one step. Oh, touchdown! And everybody goes bonkers. Because a big old gorilla could carry a ball a half a yard. And then the same men come to church and hear those great hymns being sung or a missionary present his work for God or a soul getting saved. Something's wrong with us. Something has got us to the place the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity against God. And you know what the problem with us is? We're so carnally minded that we're dead to spiritual things. And what excites us is the carnal stuff. And the good stuff doesn't seem to do anything for us. I told you, this sermon's it's not real popular. But if we'll be honest with ourselves tonight, we just might make some changes. You see, people in America are drowning in molasses. But the molasses have been renamed to magazines and newspapers and novels and fiction books and Instagram and television and music and videos and iPods and laptops and Facebook and YouTube and Pinterest and Instagram that consumes us. It consumes us. Now any one of those might be okay until it floods your life. And you're drowning in it. Listen, the Bible says in the last days, one of the signs of the times is that men will be incontinent. What does that mean? Out of control. You say, why do you, why do you even mention that, Brother Ron? Well, it's sort of like a guy sitting up late at night and his wife says, I think I'm going to go on to bed. And, okay, I'll be there in a few minutes. And an hour and a half later, after YouTube and Craigslist and who knows what else, he crawls into bed, wore out and exhausted. And then gets up the next morning and prays for an hour? Not likely. Not likely. He's eaten up with a thing called Craigslist looking for a pickup truck that he doesn't even need. And can't remember the last time he prayed and wept when he prayed. Something's happened to us. Americans turn tools into toys. We turn gadgets into gods. We even turn food into an idol. I heard or read the book by Leonard Ravenhill, Sodom Had No Bible. And the Sunday after I read that book, I preached a sermon, Abraham Had No Cell Phone. (laughs) So how do you know he didn't have a cell phone? Well, Lot was down there in Sodom and Abraham would have loved to have got a hold of Lot, but he couldn't but he could get a hold of God. We can get a hold of anybody in the world, but can we get a hold of God? Abraham knew how to get a hold of God. Do we? Take your Bible, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Can we have a sermon within a sermon? When, when Brother Koch came up to me, I said, what do you want me to do? Give me some instructions. He said, Preach. He did not say preach for 30 minutes. He said preach. If he had told me 30 minutes, I'd have stopped at 30 minutes. He didn't tell me that. So I'm going to preach till I'm th- I'm, I'm going to preach till you're through. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. I, I'm going to give you a little sermon within a sermon here. It's going to be painful. Verse 5, you, you know all this material. This isn't new to you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not what? Lust after a woman. No. It says lust after evil things. Somebody's lusting, that, lusting after things as they also lusted in verse 6. Watch this, neither be you what? idolaters. we got lust and an idolatry going on as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
Well, this is talking about Numbers chapter 11. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 11. That's what he's referring to. They're, they're lusting. What are they lusting for? Food. <laughs> they're consumed with it. They made an idol out of it. Turn to Numbers chapter 11. Look at verse 4. Man, this sermon gets me in trouble. I really do like to help God's people. I really do. And there are things that are hurting God's people, and we know it. We know it, but sometimes we just sort of need to be slapped in the face with it. Do y'all ever do like me and look in the mirror and just say, you idiot. Y'all ever do that? Please tell me you do that. That's, that's what David does over in Psalm 42. We're talking about a minute. Why are you cast down? What's your problem? He's talking to himself. I talked to myself for five and a half hours today. If I wasn't talking to the Lord, I was talking to me. I don't turn the radio on. I don't even listen to preachers. I like my silence. I like it quiet. I drove up here. It took me right at six hours. I don't know how many times I looked in the rear of you and said, you're a mess. <laughs> right? Surely I'm not the only one that does that. And sometimes when I get through preaching to myself, I get under conviction and say, boy, that's good preaching. <laughs> get right with God. <laughs> When you can preach yourself into revival, you're doing all right. Some of you need to try it. Just go home tonight, look in the mirror and say, you're a mess. The Bible says right over here, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 10, lusting and idolatry. Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, and the mixed multitude that was among them fell what? Lusting and the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish. We remember the... Oh my goodness. What are they lusting for? A Big Mac. A Whopper. Huh? Is, is that what they're lusting for? Food. That's what they're lusting for. God even tells you about it in the Psalms. Go to Psalm 78. Go to Psalm 70. Did you know a lot of times when you read the Old Testament, the Psalms will later tell you things that Genesis didn't tell you? A lot of places in the Psalms are, re are referring to stories back in Genesis and Exodus, and that's what's going on right here. Look at Psalm 78. We're going to look at a few of these real quick. 78 verse 17. I love this story. Look at Psalm 78, verse 17. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. How did they provoke him? Verse 18, they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. What are they lusting for? Food, meat. And if that's not bad enough, look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. So they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. Did you know sometimes worst thing happened, God give you what you want? He gave, the Bible says over there, it's in Numbers. I didn't read it all. It's, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let them have it until it's coming out their nose. That's what he said. And it happened. I'm going to let it come out their nostrils. I had a friend in Texas. He told, we went out to eat one time. I got me a milkshake. And I said, you want a milkshake? He said, no, I can't eat milkshakes. I hate milkshakes. I said, what's the problem? He said, when I was a kid, we went to this store and I kept asking mom for another milkshake. I ate two or three and told her I wanted another. She said, he said, after about four, I just finally, every one of them came back up. And he said, I've not had a milkshake since. Boy, I wish America would get sick of some stuff. I really do. Just get sick of it. Bible says here in verse 29, So they did eat and were well filled. He gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Well, what if God did that in here tonight? Just start walking up and down the aisle looking for the fattest. I'd be, we'd all be in trouble. Y'all getting quiet on me. I'm not picking on anybody. We're all a mess. Take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. You say, what in the world has that got to do with anything? I'm going to show you how, what God told them. And it's what's happened in America, but nobody will admit it. Nobody will talk about it. Nobody will even... even listen, I've been, I've been in a missions conference. I, I don't know. I'm, I'll be careful here. I'll get to it in just a minute. Look at this. Look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. What does he say? What's the first word? Beware. beware. Now when God says beware, you better beware. That thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping His commandments and His judgments and His statutes which I command thee this day, lest... He said, here's what could happen. You better remember. You better not forget. Lest when thou hast 
eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied and you get you a third pickup truck and a four wheeler and a new shotgun and a shotgun case then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God. He said you're going to get all this stuff and you're going to build this machine, this empire and it's going to take all of your money and all of your energy just to keep the empire and the machine moving. And you'll forget me. Turn to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. I preach this at my church. I call it idolatry in the dining room. Listen. Everybody says, well, you know, we're getting back to the way it was in the days of Lot and the days of Noah. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus said that He's going to come back when it's like it was in the days of Lot and the days of Noah. And I say, well, what was it like? Hell, oh, sodomy, sodomy, homosexual marriage, men marrying men, all that stuff. That's not what Jesus said. You go to Luke 17, He gives you a list of the way it was in the days of Lot, and He gives you a list of the way it was in the days of Noah, and there's only two things that made both lists. Eating and drinking. Eating and drinking. Eating. No matter how bad the sin gets, no matter how wicked the world gets, as long as we can eat and drink, we're happy. That's what He's saying. Because we're more interested in the physical and the carnal than we are the spiritual. We say we're grieved over what's going on in the White House in America. When Nehemiah was grieved over what was going on in Jerusalem, he wept and prayed and fasted and mourned for days. When's the last time one of us wept over what's going on in America? I mean tears rolling down the face. Shouldn't we? At least on occasion. I know you can't walk around depressed all the time. Don't want you to. Sometimes it just seems like we ought to be more broken than we are. So in Deuteronomy 28, look at verse 43. Deuteronomy 28, 43. The stranger that is within thee. This is, this is his punishment on Israel, of course, but I think we're, we're repeating history in America. The stranger that is within thee. I believe America is just about owned by aliens. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed. Oh, there it is. Till thou be what? That's what the devil does. How does he destroy all this stuff? Look at it. Until thou be destroyed, because... He's going to tell them why you're destroyed. Because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep His commandments and His statutes which He commanded thee, and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for wandering upon thy seed forever. Why? Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart. Why don't they serve Him with joyfulness and gladness of heart? For the abundance of all things. Paul said to be carnally minded is death. You see, what that means is, that's talking to saved people. Do you know when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, that's talking to saved people? Read it. It's in Romans. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to saints. And he says, he says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But what he had taught us earlier in the book of Romans is that when he was lost, he was dead to God, and when he got saved, he was dead to sin. When you and I were lost, we were dead to God, but when we get saved, we're supposed to be dead to sin and alive to God. But when you and I, because we still have that old man to deal with, we pursue all the fleshly, worldly, carnal things and we're consumed with fleshly, worldly, carnal things and we're motivated by fleshly, worldly, carnal things and we're always looking at fleshly, worldly, carnal things and we get consumed and eat up with it and we're excited about all those things, then when we come to church, we're dead to spiritual things. And that's what's going on in America. Now, I'm not suggesting all those things are wrong until the tank busts and it floods your life. Well, God will let us have a lot of stuff. But when that stuff has us, we're in trouble. It's amazing what you might be allowed to own until it owns you. 
God's gr- gracious and generous with us. Turn to, turn, to, turn to Luke 8. Turn to Luke 8. Now a lot of this, of course, has to do with food. I, I, can't, I, I can't deny that I'm convinced. This, this is just me talking. But I believe I can back it up with the Bible. I'm convinced that Americans' eating habits is the reason we're so carnal. I believe fasting is New Testament theology. I really do. And, and listen, let, let's just be realistic. You, you, you go out to eat at a buffet, and then you go home, what do you feel like doing? Praying and reading your Bible for an hour? <laughs> and Americans are not the smartest people in the world. In the world. They'll, they'll, get this, they'll go to these buffets and foods fall off the side of the plate. And they'll say, give me a Diet Coke. <laughs> Did you know some people think that neutralizes whatever they put in their body? And it doesn't work. <laughs> Have you ever looked at people that drink Diet Cokes? It doesn't work. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll sit down and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Did you know when you get through eating, you're supposed to feel better? And you'll get up and go... I'm miserable. Oh, I couldn't, I can't believe I did that again. Huh? I'm just telling you that's the way we, that's not good. We're laughing right now, but we probably should be crying. And, and the Bible has a lot to say about this subject, but really most people don't want to know what the Bible says about it. Look at Luke chapter 8, look at verse 14 real quick. I need to hurry. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. We have the best preachers in the world in America. Brother Logan and his brother Brent, what a blessing. Brother Knox comes up here, what a blessing. Your pastor, what a blessing. We could, we could name so many good, strong, Bible-believing preachers that get up in the pulpit every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and I mean, shell the corn. I mean, they feed God's people. And then we go to a restaurant, and then we go home and turn on the NFL, and by 4 o'clock, that word has not had any opportunity at all to work in our hearts. The old-timers, the old farmers... The old timers in America, colonial America, they'd go home, sit on the porch, and let that thing soak a while. Or they'd invite people from the church over to their house on Sunday afternoon, and they'd talk about what God did that morning in church. That old farmer would get up on Monday morning, go out to the field, still thinking about that sermon. But after one football game or one movie, do you really want to tell me that the Word of God's still on your mind and heart? People say, well, you know, I watch television, but not very often. It's just not a big deal with me. Let me just ask you this. If Paul the Apostle watched as much TV as you, would he have accomplished what he accomplished? Luke 21. Luke 21. You remember that crowd over there in Joshua 24 where they, they told Joshua, they, he told them, he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And he challenged them. And after he got through chapter, he said, okay, okay, whew, we're going to serve the Lord. He said, you can't. Y'all ever read that chapter? <laughs> Y'all, that you read that and you think, what? He told them to serve the Lord. They said, okay. And he said, well, you can't. Yep. If you read that chapter, you'll find out why. Because they won't let go of other gods. And our God's a jealous God. And we're going to serve Him. We're going to have to let some things go. We're going to have to get rid of some stuff. The Bible says here in Luke chapter 21, verse 34, Luke chapter 21, verse 34, another familiar verse, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. Somebody tell me what surfeiting means. Excess. I probably heard some other synonyms. Excess. By the the way, I think drunkenness there, I I think you can be drunk on video games. You can be drunk on pickup trucks. You can be drunk on food. You, it's, it's stuff that, I believe it's considered mind-altering. And get your mind twisted and 
destroyed. Where you don't think quite clear anymore. Solomon said, I got it all. I got it all. And what was it? Vexation of spirit. Just vexed me. Whatever I wanted. It's at my fingertips. I call this sermon restoring the soul. I could easily call it drowning in molasses, but the molasses have been changed to video games and cell phones and laptops and Facebook and YouTube and email and email and texting and Pinterest and Twitter, etc., etc., etc. It is the little foxes that spoil the vines, and we got a bunch of them in our living room. And we can't handle them. And when I preach like this, even preachers get frustrated with me. Because I've been, in a, I've been in missions conferences where the pastor said, Brother Ron, we'd like for you to come sit down with the missionaries and just let them ask you questions. We're just going to talk about missions and ministry and so on. You get around the table, you've got six, eight guys sitting there. We're going to be there for an hour and a half. Here's how it goes. For an hour and a half. I meet my son... Ever so often, he lives an hour and 15 minutes from me. When I meet him for lunch, we don't even talk about it. I leave my phone in the truck, he leaves his in the truck. We, we, we never once discussed it. We're getting together to visit. If I was sitting here talking to Brother Crotz face to face, and Brother Kyle just walked up and said, Hey, Brother Crotz, hey! Brother Crotz would think, Brother Kyle, that's pretty rude. I can't believe you interrupted us like that. But you let the phone do it all the time. You can't even carry on a conversation. Let me ask you this. When's the last time... How many, how many of you face the curse that I face? You're on your hands and your knees and you're praying and you really, really want to get a hold of God and three minutes into it, your mind's completely somewhere else. What is that? How in the world does those old-timers pray for two hours? Y'all understand what I'm saying, don't you? Paul said there's some things that used to be really, really, really important to me. But he said, now I count them but dung that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection. I wonder what we're willing to count as dung in order to know Him. They say that you can have some precious cargo on a ship that people won't give up for anything until the ship starts to sink. And then they're glad to throw off some of that precious cargo. We've got a lot of Christians that are sinking. They better get rid of some cargo. I believe Hebrews called them weights. Weights. Hindrances. Molasses. The importance of the mind in the Bible. David said, It was in my mind to build... Nehemiah, the people had a mind to work. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Neither be of doubtful mind. Acts 17, readiness of mind. Romans 12, the renewing of your mind. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. They first had a willing mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It's obvious God wants you to have a sound mind, so the devil wants you to have an unsound mind that's twisted and polluted and crowded and cluttered so that your emotional well-being is so messed up you can't really stay focused on what matters most. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm 42 and then Isaiah 42. Psalm 42. The Bible talks about fainting in your mind. The end result of what's been going on in America for at least the last 50 years is bitterness and anger and worry and stress and tension, depression, discouragement, road rage, passivity, no burden, no tears, no power, people enduring Christianity instead of enjoying it, no peace, no passion, no power, 
But David said, He restoreth my soul. Let me be mean for just a minute. If it wasn't for the news media, you wouldn't be near as tore up about COVID. Now, I've been saying this to my folks for the last two years. I know COVID can kill you. I know COVID's real. But I know 10 years ago, hospitals were full of people that had the flu. And some people died of it. I know that. But never in a time in this country is it like it is now where you are bombarded by the news media and social media and, and you know everything that's going on. You even know the names of all the experts. Who in the world was Tony Fauci before all this happened? I met in my church. He's in heaven now. He said an expert is a former pert. <laughs> I like that. And so I was preaching in Alabama one time. I was preaching for Brother Lee. And this lady had me over. I, I, I think I probably preached this message. She had me over and fed me a great meal. She was a sweet lady. And she said, Brother Ron, I just want to ask you an honest question. She said, if you don't watch TV and you don't listen to talk radio, how do you know what's going on? I said, ma'am, there'll always be people like you to keep me informed. <laughs> and she laughed. I was trying to be cute with her, okay? So she knew what I was saying. Isn't it true? And what, what do you know that you need to know? Can I tell you something? Whatever it is you think you know, you don't. All you know is somebody's opinion. And I don't care if you're on the right or the left of this thing. My, my marching orders has not changed. I'm not going to live in fear. And by the way, I'd rather live dying than to die living. I'm telling you, people are so messed up. And they're consumed with this stuff. That's my rabbit trail for the night. The Bible says in Psalm 42, verse 5. Did I ask you to turn to Psalm 42? Yes. Look at verse 5. And let me catch up to you. The Bible says in verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. Verse 6, O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Verse 11, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Have you ever been there? You ever been cast down? I'd love to preach to you about cast down sheep. I read a book at one time about sheep that get cast down and why they get cast down. And it's because of comfort, clinging, and being clumsy, trying to carry too much weight. I won't preach that message, but I want you to turn to Isaiah 42. Turn to Isaiah 42. Cast down. Why art thou cast down? Oh, my soul. I'll tell you why. I quit watching CNN. I'd be cast down too if I watched CNN and Fox as much as some people. Say, you don't like Fox? I hate Fox. Why would I like Fox? Verse 18. That's what Herod, that's what Jesus called Herod. Go tell that Fox. Fox is sly. They just look conservative. Well, that ruined some of your nights. Look at verse 18. Isaiah 42, verse 18. He says over there in Psalms, why am I cast down? What's going on with me? What's my problem? Verse 18, hear ye deaf and look ye blind that ye may see. Verse 19, who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger that I send? Who is blind as he that is perfect and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But, God said, I'm going to speak. I'm going to make my law. But listen to me. This is a people robbed and what? What's spoiled? Taken captive. Like the spoils of war. They're, they're in prison. Look at this. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivereth for a spoil. And none saith, restore. Nobody's crying out, restore. They've gotten comfortable in their bondage. Just keep sending me the government check. Because I can make more drawing a check from the government than I can doing what God said and getting out and working by the straw to my brow. Just don't disconnect my cable, and whatever you do, don't close down the restaurants. And I really don't care what you do after that. That's America. 
We probably got more upset about restaurants closing down than we did men burying men when they passed that one. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to show you what's going on in our country. And maybe I'm trying to show you why it takes some of these missionaries three, four, and five years to raise their support. Because we won't turn off cable TV and give it to missions. People tell me all the time, Brother Ron, I'm giving all I can give. I say, you got cable TV? Yeah. I said, then you ain't giving all you can give. I'd rather give Brother Mullinax some money to go to China, Korea, or wherever. As to, as, to, as to be able to watch 232 channels and all of it not fit to watch. You ever seen these people with a remote control? First, they can't find it, so they'll walk around for 30 minutes to find it. All they got to do is walk over the TV and hit a button. You say, how long are you going to do that? About as long as you do. And you go through 232 channels and say, ain't nothing worth watching. Then you get rid of the stupid cable TV. <laughs> what do you expect to come out of Hollywood? People don't love God. The God of this world is controlling that stuff. None. None. They're in prison. They're ensnared. And nobody says restore. We're comfortable in our bondage. So how do we get restored? I'm only going to give you three out of seven things from Psalm 23 because I want them to stick with you. Please remember this. Number one, with a place. He said there in verse 2, Psalm 23, green pastures and still waters. You ought to just look up the word pasture in the, in the dictionaries. It says a pleasant place. Y'all are back there. Let's look at it. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still. Doesn't that just sound beautiful? <laughs> My soul's cast down. I'm exhausted. I'm wore out. I'm stressed out. I'm frustrated. So-and-so's in the hospital. So-and-so's got COVID. My, 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 my bills keep coming in. But oh, He, He leads me beside the still waters and makes me to lie down in green pastures. The best way to restore your soul is with a place. There ought to be two places where you can find this kind of rest. Your home and the church house. It ought not to be World War III at your house. Did you know that in the book of Ruth, marriage is called a rest? Your home ought to be a place to get away from this stinking world, not to turn it on. Go home and play Monopoly. Okay? Scrabble. Okay? Tic-tac-toe. I don't care. Just turn off the television. Do something where you have to spell, not your phone. Thank you. You'll be surprised what it'll do for your mind. You'll be surprised. About six months after that, your mind's going to be so much more clear. You're going to know what 2 plus 2 is. You'll be able to spell your name. Listen, I preach this stuff in my church about the things that God clearly teaches in the garden. He wanted men to work. They breathe fresh air. They communicated with each other. You go to a restaurant now and you've got five people at the same table and all of them on a different gadget. And I hope it's not that way at your house. You want to get your soul restored two places. Your house and the house of God. So leave all that stuff out. Well, I'm wanting to say some stuff. There's things going on in churches now that drive me crazy. I was, pre I was preaching in church in West Tennessee. And I went down and sat on the front pew. It was about the third night I was there. And I preached there every year. And a little old boy, couldn't have been over seven or eight years old, sitting there playing a video game. And I walked in, sat down, and he looked up, and he said, Hi, Brother Ron. He said, What video games did you play when you were a little boy? I said, Well, we called it hauling hay. <laughs> All of our games, we were really creative. We, we played a game. When, see, i got nine brothers and sisters. 
and South Alabama. And we're sitting around trying to decide what to do. Nobody wanted to go in the house. Nobody. We did not have central heat and air. We raised the windows and hoped for a warm breeze. <laughs> so we create games. I mean, we were, we were genius. We got a game. Everybody should love this game. It's called Run Around the House. <laughs> One guy, and, and, and there's no, we didn't have lights. No floodlights, no, no electric lights. I mean, it's dark. And somebody goes back in the back and he's by himself and we've got to run around the house and get back to home base before he touches us. And we'd do that for hours. Because we didn't want to go in. There was no television and there was no central heat and air. And all of us were thin and none of us wore glasses. <laughs> you look at kids today compared to the 1960s. Something's wrong. I know people are going to get mad when I talk like this. And ADD? Who ever heard of such? Man, I went to Ryan School when I was in the fifth grade. Fifth grade was on this side of the room. Sixth grade was on that side of the room. Fifty students, one teacher. She had no discipline problems. Zero. I was sitting on the front seat one time. Miss Cook, I'll never forget it. Miss Cook, she's about five foot one, weighed about 260. She was tall on her back and she was on her feet. <laughs> and Miss Cook said something and I, but I smarted off to her. And I'm not kidding you, before the last word left my lip, Miss Cook took the back of her hand and went, boom! <laughs> I was cured of ADD for the rest of the year. <laughs> I'm telling you, she had done no trouble out of me the rest of the year. I had a lady tell me one time, she said, my boy's, but the doctor told me he's got a chemical imbalance. What am I going to do? I said, my daddy knew how to balance them chemicals. <laughs> you think these computers and video games and gadgets are really going to help your children? Let them sweat. You say, we live in town now. We can't let them get out and farm and haul hay. Get a set of post hole diggers. Let them dig a hole six feet deep and then cover it up. Amen. It's good for them. It beats the fire out of sitting on a couch watching a big screen. I could preach on this a lot longer. With a place and with a path. He says here that, that He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Paths. I believe Jesus said that path would be straight and narrow, didn't He? I believe maybe our path's gotten too wide. I believe we might have too many irons in the fire. I believe our path might be too cluttered and too complicated and too busy. You ever gone to somebody's house and they say, well, just come on in and sit down if I can clear a path. <laughs> wow, I didn't think that'd be funny. <laughs> Something tells me y'all know some of these people. God likes things clean. He likes things decently and in order. Amen. And we live in a chaotic world Amen. by choice. I'm going to lose the theme of this message if you're not careful. Let me, let me get to the last point. I want you to listen to me, please. How do you restore your soul? With a place, with a path, and with His presence. I'm skipping some things. Verse 4. For thou art with me. Hmm. When's the last time you enjoyed the presence of God? Listen to me. Listen to me. At your house. I'm not talking about here. People talk about, oh, I just want to go to church to worship and praise the Lord. Well, really, that's probably not when worship should take place. If you study the word worship in the Bible and study the word praise in the Bible, most of the time praise is the public stuff. Get together, raise your hands. I don't care if you run an aisle, shout hallelujah, glory to God, amen. You, you ought to praise the Lord at church. But worship is more private. Worship's more personal. It's when they're bowing their face and, and they're just, it's, it's one man with God Almighty. I got a special place at my property. I went there yesterday. I said, Lord, I, I just need to spend some time with you. 
I'm going to Brother Nathan Brown's after I leave here on Wednesday. Preach there Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I don't want to preach without His presence. If I spend all of my time doing the things that I could spend my time doing, I'll never have His presence, His power, His touch. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. You know why you lose faith and you get tore up about COVID and all this stuff that's going on in our world? You won't be still. You won't be quiet. You know what Jeremiah called Pharaoh? Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Egypt, the type of the world. Je- Jeremiah called him a noise. Pharaoh's a noise. We got too many noises in our lives. Over in Habakkuk, they're praising and worshiping all those false idols and false gods. And that's where you read where God said to them, let all the earth keep silent before me. It's like he's saying, if they can bow down five times a day and stop what they're doing, how about my people stopping what they're doing? And laying aside some things so that you can spend time with Him. So He can talk to you. Study to be quiet, the Bible says. Meditate in Joshua. Meditate in the Psalms. So much of the Bible is about being still and being quiet and sitting and just talking to God. Listen, I know you have the Holy Spirit if you're saved. But does the Holy Spirit have you? In the 1800s when he was talking about trying to get an evangelist to preach a meeting, everybody said, Moody, Moody, get Moody, get Moody. One jealous preacher said, What's the big deal with Moody? Does he have a monopoly on God? And one preacher said, no. God's got a monopoly on Moody. He ought to have a monopoly on us. But I wonder sometimes if the riches and the cares and the pleasures of this world and the molasses has got a monopoly on our lives. Maybe tonight you'd like to restore some things. Let's all stand with heads bowed, eyes closed. The Lord spoke to your heart. I'd encourage you to come and talk to Him. Maybe get someone to come and just play uh, something softly on the piano, please. Father, I've uh, tried to give these folks my heart.